Thank you very much, Kerry. Good morning, everyone. And good morning to a very, very good morning to a very interesting morning, too. Yeah. And today, actually, we are having a very, very interesting session. And we will start off this interesting session with two interesting videos. So can I have the first video, please? A mystery illness has hit a remote town in Colombia. More than 200 girls have been hospitalized after receiving shots of a vaccine to prevent cervical cancer. CCTV's Michelle Begge reports Colombian health officials and Colombia's president have denied accusations over the vaccine. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos has dismissed reports that the vaccine Gardasil is causing a mystery illness in the Colombian town called Carmen de Bolívar. No hay. There has not been found and there is no evidence that there is a connection between the symptoms of these girls and the vaccine for papillomavirus. Since May, more than 240 girls have reported headaches, fainting and numbness in the hands after vaccination. Parents say the girls ranging in ages from 9 to 16 were recently injected with Gardasil, a vaccine against the human papillomavirus or HPV, which has been linked to cervical cancer. In two Thanks. Video two, please. Sorry, now the health ministry has ordered a probe after four infants all below nine months died near Lucknow after they were vaccinated for measles. Now, all of them showed symptoms of a serious allergic reaction, which possibly caused their deaths. <laughs> Minutes after they were given the measles vaccine, four infants, Kumari, Sanya, Rekha and Sahil, fell seriously ill. They became breathless, began to sweat and their pulse fell rapidly. All symptoms of anaphylactic shock or a serious allergic reaction to the vaccine. And before they could get medical help at the local hospital, all four had died. <laughs> Such measles vaccine related deaths are rare. But okay, can we have the slides, please? Now, mind you, we have had a week's, in fact, it was nice to hear that one week you have been able to manage to sit here. Just imagine if you were actually in front of this kind of a situation. All the theory which you learned, all the stuff which you learned, actually is a completely different ballgame altogether. Don't you agree? So today, I'm just going to tell you about adverse events following immunization. And I'm going to just take you through a journey of the next in the next 25 minutes on something which is very, very interesting and very, very important for all of us. So if we want, we, as far as I'm concerned, my talk is divided into two parts. I'm just going to talk to you about the lessons from previous adverse events of vaccination and assessment and also assessment of causal relationship. But for the second one, I'm just going to be very, very short. In other words, it's going to be a trailer of what is actually going to be coming up tomorrow. Because tomorrow we are having a full one and a half hour session on causality assessment where we are having a group work and I'll be taking you through a journey on that. Now, mind you, usually when we conduct these trainings, it is done over a period of four days in countries. So I just cannot cover that in four minutes. So I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what is going to be coming up. Now, let us first of all start the story. And uh, when you, uh, what we are really worried about, when you look at the worries which we have, when we, when we set up, uh, uh, when we work in vaccine safety, we are actually worried about real incidents, you know, related to particular vaccines. For instance, polio following IPV, intussusception, narcolepsy, and of course, now we have heard about the TTS and all that stuff. So that is related to particular vaccines. Now, when you, we are also worried about real safety issues. Like, you know, this narcolepsy, we just uh, had uh, Kairi talking about it. If you talk to her, she'll really tell you the entire story about how they picked it up and things like that. Now, the next thing which we are also worried about is real safety issues, you know, like programmatic errors. Like, you know, like if you just look at this, you, I'm, go, I'm going to just show you, give you a, some details about this as we are going to be talking today. We are also worried about other issues like anaphylaxis, which is really related to certain vaccines. And of course, the biggest thing which we are really, really worried about is actually rumors, poor signs and overreaction. And this has got 
huge impact, huge impact in immunization coverage. As you will see here, you know, in Denmark, when the immunization coverage actually dropped as a result of rumors which came up with regard to the HPV vaccine, we get more and more rumors as well. So, yeah, I, yes, I can see what, uh, you know, uh, Kamal is saying, you know, people complain usually after my talk that I talk too fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. So please, you're welcome to say slow down. Huh? Mother, please slow down. Because I get involved in the in, in the topic so much that finally I end up uh, going. In fact, I heard a comment once that your, your mouth is trying to keep up with your brain. <laughs> okay. So let me then continue. So please feel free to worry, to, to, to interrupt me. Now, when you, the biggest worry, ladies and gentlemen, now is actually falsified vaccines. This is becoming a huge problem. And in fact, it is not only related to COVID, it is related to other vaccines like, you know, for instance, cholera vaccines. I, let me give you a small, I, I wish I could switch off the, the screen. You know, like recently in one country in South, uh, in Southeast Asia, do you know what happened? The, the, the actually, the devil is not outside. It is within us. What happened was there was this particular nurse. You know what she did? She visited her friends' nurses in the hospitals. And when she visited them, she just made only, she, you know, after the general conversation, she just tells them only one thing. She just tells them, you know, when this pentavalent vaccine comes in, no, just, you know, don't throw that empty vial into the dustbin. Just take it and give it to me. So she and her husband collected that vial in the evening. And not in the evening, maybe once a week, they make a circle around the hospital, collect that vial. And then the, the, the vial is again circulated back into the hospitals. You understand what I mean? It is refilled and circulated back into the hospitals. And when it is refilled and circulated back into the hospitals, for your information, do you know what happened? The, this, this went on not for one year, two years, gentlemen. It went on for 13 years. And by, do, you, do you know how it was picked up? It was picked up not by surveillance systems. It was actually picked up by the income tax department. Do you know how? Because they made so much amount of money. They made so much amount of money that she didn't know what to do with it. And it was, she started posting pictures on Facebook and, and uh, in social media, you know, huge cars, big houses. And then the income tax department came back and then they caught her. And imagine all the kids who are vaccinated. And mind you, this was done in the private sector. It was not done in the government sector. And what does the private sector doctor say? The private sector doctor goes and says, you know, if you give the government uh, sector vaccine, they gave whole cell pertussis vaccine, which has got more AEFIs compared to the acellular pertussis, which we are giving. You understand? So in other words, you are actually promoting without knowing the fake vaccines yourself. So you should be extremely careful about this when you're actually doing your work right now. Now, this is something which is very, very important. If there is one take home message which I want in this particular session, it is this particular thing. It's very important for you to understand this. Now, let us look at what is an AEFI. Now, an adverse event, I'm, I'm actually very glad that, uh, you know, my session was preceded by a session by Dr. Narendra Arora, where he kind of talked to you about the biological mechanisms and also how does an adverse event occur. I'm, what I'm going to tell you is the impact of the adverse events. And for, and also I'm going to tell you techniques of actually convincing people and also being very clear on when you develop your guidelines and things like that, how to handle it. Now, first of all, when you look at it, what is an adverse event following immunization? So it is any untoward medical occurrence which follows immunization and which does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the usage of the vaccine, right? Can you tell me which is the most important part of this definition? Absolutely right, because that's in italics as well, right? <laughs> so it does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the usage of the vaccine. Okay, now... Again, no, let me, I, I'll just go proceed the slide with just one more slide. That is important because if you look at the, re the reason why it's so important is, if you look at the previous definition, this was used until 2004. In, okay, this was the definition which came up in 2004. The previous definition which I showed you came up in 2012. Now, this definition, this pre previous definition had a major problem. That the earlier definition was an adverse event following immunization is a medical incident that takes place after immunization, causes concern and is believed to be caused by immunization. You understand? Now, 
when this particular definition is put up into your guidelines, what happens? Any event which occurs after vaccination and you think is due to vaccination is because of vaccination. So, in other words, here, look from the legal perspective, the vaccine is guilty until proved innocent. Whereas, in the previous definition, if you go back to it, because it does not necessarily, sorry, uh, be, so, sorry, because it does not necessarily have a causal relationship, it means the vaccine is actually innocent until proved guilty. Is it clear? Why I am trying to tell you this is when you guys, when you go back to your countries, when you look at your national AEFI guidelines, please make sure that this definition is used. The new WHO definition is used because I have actually seen countries where there have been litigations and legal problems which have occurred mainly because the wrong definition was actually used. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, this again, adverse event may be and sorry. I'm actually, I need to get used to this uh, thing. Okay, it may, be an un, uh, it may be an unfavorable or an unintended sign, an abnormal lab finding, symptom or disease. So what is the meaning of the word? Each word you must understand very clearly. What is the meaning of a symptom? A symptom is something which a patient comes to you with, right? And a sign is something which a doctor finds out. Like when you examine the patient, you auscultate and find out a lung sign or a cardiac murmur or things like that. Or I ex examine the abdomen, feel that the liver is enlarged and things like that. So that is actually a, a sign. A lab finding, what you see is a thrombocytopenia. It can be an ECG finding. It can be an MRI finding. It can be a CT scan finding like you're in TTS. So it can also be a disease like, you know, the vaccine associated paralytic polio, meningitis, etc., etc. So this is some, this definition is very, very, very important. So if you want you take home message for you is never forget this definition. Okay. So that is something you have to keep in mind. Now, one more thing you have to keep in mind is you should understand what is the meaning of the word a serious AEFI versus a non-serious AEFI. These are the two things you should remember. What is the difference? So serious AEFI is only very simple. Five things. It is a death, a disability. A, con a, a, a congenital anomaly, it can be a life-threatening or any other medically significant event. Is it clear? Only five things. A death, hospitalization, disability, congenital anomaly, or a medical life-threatening or a medically significant event. So this is important. Why is this important? Because when we do causality assessment, we usually do causality assessment for serious cases. For non-serious cases, we generally do not do it unless it's a cluster. Okay, unless it's a cluster. Okay, so this is something you have to keep in mind. Now, this is also something which is my entire next few minutes or few, the time is going to be spent on this thing. When you look at the classification of AEFIs, you're actually going to classify AEFIs into vaccine product related reaction. What is the meaning of the word vaccine product related reaction? It means the vaccine. So supposing if you just take a, take a vaccine, I usually say that supposing if you just take a vaccine, the substance, all the ingredients which you learned in the last few days, those ingredients, if they cause the adverse event, it is a vaccine product related reaction. It does not mean that it has to be the antigen. It can be any other substance which is present inside the vaccine. Okay. So this is like if you, what you see on the screen is like, you know, after you give a vaccine, most of the vaccine reactions are actually minor, most of them. Okay. So that's something you have to keep in mind. Now, the next thing which you are talking about is a quality defect related reaction. You must have heard about this cutter incident. Have you? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, if we had time, I would have discussed more. But just for your information, you know what happened in, in the 1950s? You know, the better vaccine, the vaccine which was used at that time was the IPV. And IPV, as you all know, is much more better in terms of immunogenicity. But unfortunately, what happened was in 19, uh, 1955, when, you, when IPV was, was prepared in the Cutter Laboratories in Philadelphia, actually in, in Berkeley, sorry, in Berkeley, in California, what happened was they, the vaccine was not properly inactivated. And children were actually given the wild, wild virus and were injected with the wild virus. It actually was 120,000 child kids were vaccinated, 40,000 developed mild polio, 400, 200 were paralyzed and 10 of them died. Now, what you see here is, can any of you tell me what this one is? It's an immunization error related adverse event. What happened? Any guesses? Sorry? BCG related 
abscess. Okay, what has happened is you should also always remember if you see when you choose your needle and also the for injections, you should choose the correct needle. You should administer it at the correct angle. You should also make sure that the route of administration is correct. What is to be given as an intradermal injection was actually given subcutaneously or intramuscularly. So six months later, not even immediately, the, the child developed axillary lymph nodes enlargement. It burst open and what you're seeing is actually an abscess which burst open and caused this problem. You understand? So this is an immunization error related adverse event which occurs because of improper vaccine handling, prescribing or administration. Now, this is an immunization anxiety related reaction. Okay, you, yeah, it, it looks very funny, but you just look at the facial expressions. Huh? This, these guys are beginning to laugh. You become serious, serious, and then he starts with. Now, mind you, the problem is, the problem is, this is a, this, let me tell you something very honest. I have a, a few slides on this. It's becoming a major problem with COVID. Why? Because earlier, when you look at vaccines, it used to be given for kids, small kids, right? And it is given for kids who are babies. So supposing you carry a baby and go for vaccination, if it is even DTP or, uh, you know, usually give it at 6, 10 and uh, 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 14 weeks. So, the, you, uh, you know, the baby is on the mother's arms. You just give the, the baby gets a vaccination ah! and then afterwards it stops. You understand? But now with teenage girls and teenage boys watching the vaccination, especially HPV vaccines, we have had clusters of cases where, you know, what, what has happened? People have actually taken, as a child is fainting, they take the mobile phone, take the video, and it is circulated throughout the whole school. You understand? And when the next kid is coming, the kid is actually apprehensive. And then if an ambulance comes, there is a video of the ambulance which goes into social media. And actually, you start getting clusters of ISRR, immunization stress-related responses. We have had clusters in countries which are far away from one another. So there might be an immunized, mass immunization campaign conducted throughout the country, but you will get a cluster of AEFIs in the northern part and the western part and things like that. So we have had major instances like that. Okay. Now, this is the, so this is an ISRR. Then we have a coincidental event. Like what you do is you develop a fever uh, post vaccination, you develop fever and then convulsions. And then when you actually go and check, then what you find is you actually find that it is because of a malarial parasite. You understand? Or, so let us quickly look at this. I'll just give you some very typical examples. Now, when you look at it, I told you, now, when you look at AEFIs, you are, let us, I told you what is a serious AEFI and a non-serious AEFI. Now, in the serious AEFIs, we are worried only about serious AEFIs primarily, okay? Now, if you look at it, I, since I'm not going to ask you questions because we don't lack time, I can still see I'm having only short time left. Now, how do you classify that? So most of them are actually immunized. When you investigate, you find them. Most of them are immunization error related adverse events. Number three. But you find to a lesser extent, I would put number four and five equal. Like, you know, even nowadays we get more amount of immunization anxiety related reactions, ISRR. And also coincidental events are coming up in equal measure nowadays. But earlier it used to be more coincidental and less ISRRs. Then the next highest would be vaccine product related reaction and quality defect related reactions. So let's quickly go through some examples. I really, um, mainly because I'm lacking time. Sorry, I'm fast. Okay. I can, I have lots of stories to tell. So this one, for instance, in fact, I was involved in this investigation in Syria. What happened was, if you just look at Syria, you know, the, 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 this thing is going on. No, the war in Syria was going on a few years back. Okay. So in 2014, when this event actually took place, what was happening was something very, very sad, very sad. The hospitals used to get, the planes used to come and bomb the hospitals. So there are refugee camps around the hospitals. You understand? And when the planes used to come and when mothers want to get the kids immunized. So what, what they do is they take the kids for to the hospital for immunization. But because the hospital is being bombed, what used to be happening was, so there used to be a hospital in the middle, let us say in the middle. And around that, they used to keep some small tents. So used to have immunization camps, which are conducted in the tents around the hospital. You understand what I mean? So... When the planes used to come and bomb, they may bomb the hospital, but not the tents. And that's how they escaped. Now, what happened was on this particular time in September, this uh, kids were brought, you know, in measles comes in 10 dose vials, right? It comes in freeze dried 10 dose vials. So once they reconstitute, they actually expect so many kids to come and stand in the queue to get vaccinated. So when they were actually standing in the queue to get vaccinated, you know what, what was happening? The kids get vaccinated. So there is a tent. The mothers go into the stand in the queue, get vaccinated. And as soon as they, they are all interested in getting out of the getting out because of the bombing. As soon as they get out, 
the kids die in their arms. Can you tell me what happened? The kids, as they get out of the tents, the children are dying in the arms of the mother. And that is why, it, if you are, when I went for the investigation, it is definitely more than 34. It is more than 50 kids who died on that day. Can you tell me what happened? Okay, we, let's not argue. <laughs> the, 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 what happened was the dial event was actually replaced with atricurium. You understand? You understand? So the children devil suffocated to death and died. Okay, so this, and do you know the reason for that? It is don't blame the health workers. Do not blame the health workers. When we investigated, we found out that the, that the labels are in English. The health workers can't read. You understand? It is as simple as that. So something which is something very, very simple like that can cause huge number of impact. So remember, when you are running your programs, look into details, look into pro, uh, look into issues. In this one, 15 children in Sudan, actually because of untrained vaccinators, it is not untrained vaccinators, ladies and gentlemen, who died in Sudan, who did the vaccination. Do you know what happened? Money was given to the government. The government then went and, like what we do for microplanning, no? We do microplanning and then we do this, we pay money to the local guys to do the thing. When they did the training, they took the money and then they asked the children, the small kids, 9-year-old, 10-year-old, you vaccinate them like you inject dolls. You understand? So they went total, uh, they were, they did not give any uh, attention, pay any attention to uh, sterility. The vaccine was kept in room temperature and boiling heat of uh, Sudan and it was vaccinated. No wonder so many people died. Actually, you, you understand. So there are so I have hundreds of stories. I have stories where health centers were burnt down. I can show you a video there. I still I have lots of videos also on this. Okay. Now, in this case, in when this is actually a, a very sad death which occurred in the southernmost tip of Sri Lanka. What happened was at that point in time, the the you know, this child was a part of a school health program, was vaccinated. Okay. In to make cut the long story short. The child was vaccinated. The anaphylaxis was identified as an AEFI. It was identified. The child was taken to the hospital, admitted. But unfortunately, the clinical case management of the child was not good. The child died of fluid overload and extra doses of adrenaline. Multiple doses of adrenaline was given. You understand? So these are the kind of things which we will, we will, uh, uh, we face every time. Now let's look at coincidental events. Now this particular girl, if you just see, this girl was actually Natalie Morton. And uh, so basically when uh, this happened in the UK with the HPV vaccine, luckily when they did a postmortem, they found out that she actually had a mediastinal tumor. Okay, so but many people don't allow postmortems. Imagine what happens in those cases. We really do not know what is what is wrong with them. Now in in, in India, one one this is a very interesting uh, thing which happened. Now what happens is when you introduce mass uh, drug vaccination, please be careful about the local epidemiology which occurs there, because if there is the JE Japanese encephalitis vaccine was given in 2006 and when it was started when it was started around the same time after vaccination they noticed that kids develop convulsions and then they uh, and also severe jaundice later when they checked they found out it is because they were actually consuming this particular lentil okay this is called the cassia occidentalis so this was this is something which will which is a coincidental event now let's quickly go through immunization anxiety related events this is nothing new because i'm uh, and if you just see there's a mass psychogenic reactions have been reported like what i just told you right now and if you just look at it we have heard about this earlier earlier we were actually calling this as immunization who was calling this as immunization anxiety related responses but now things have changed we are now calling this immunization stress related responses since 2018 okay and this manual which you see right now here this has actually come out. Please read this. It's a fantastic uh, uh, ready reckoner. It will help you to address the issues, mainly because we are beginning to see major issues with COVID vaccines also. And what are we seeing right now? If you look at what has happened, there are two publications which have come out. One, this is the one which is in Japanese, uh, where they, you know, when they vaccinated 30,000 individuals, they looked at, if you just see, they looked at vasovagal syncope and acute allergic reactions. If you just see the acute, the it was acute adverse events were observed in 1.1% of the recipients with the first dose and 0.4% with the second dose. Most of it was vasovagal syncope followed by acute allergic reactions. And it was the highest in the younger population. Can you see this? In the younger age groups, you should expect this in this particular population. But age dependency was not seen for other allergic reactions. Now, it was mostly seen in women 
women compared to men. But one interesting thing is vasovagal syncope occurs less than 20 minutes, whereas allergic reactions usually seen after 20 minutes. Something similar is also seen in the US. I don't want to go into details because of lack of time. But what I wanted to tell you is, please remember, ISRR is now getting mistaken for anaphylaxis. Understand. So you should always be careful about when you are actually looking at it. So uh, so you should be able to go through. Uh, in fact, when you do the causality assessment, we'll be able to explain that to you tomorrow. So this is my, the next thing is your vaccine product related reaction. If you just look at it, uh, this is the rotavirus vaccine with intersusception. I'm not going into details because this was explained earlier. And then with regard to the COVID vaccines, of course, we have this uh, sessions on this thrombosis, thrombocytopenia syndrome uh, and how it, we actually classified it after COVID vaccines. But what is interesting for this particular uh, se session is what is the lessons learned? That is what we have to do. You see, from our perspective, we need to see what is when you what we normally do from the safety perspective is we balance the benefit risk and then we make an assessment. So this particular slide was actually developed by the UK. And if you just see very interestingly, when the exposure risk is very low, if you see we actually giving the vaccine is a disadvantage except in older populations. But if the exposure risk is very, very high, there is more benefits to giving vaccination compared to the risks. You understand? So if you are giving advice to, to the governments, it's important for you to balance the risk-benefit analysis before you actually provide this uh, uh, sessions. So the last part of it is vaccine quality defect-related reactions. The, historically, if you see, this is not the first time if you just see vaccine quality defect related reactions have occurred. That is the cutter incident. Okay. There are right from the time when rabies vaccine was first made to this Lubeck incident where, you know, the TB, uh, you know, wild, uh, the TB bacteria was accidentally injected to the serum which contained uh, hepatitis B, you know, was injected. So that has been there. But one interesting thing is the cutter incident was the last major incident. After that, we have not, because of the stringent regulatory activity which is taking place, we are very, very careful to see that this doesn't happen. So that is my last part of the first part of my talk. So let me just quickly finish this by saying, this is the AEFI surveillance and trying to find out the cause. Okay, what you see here on the screen is the AEFI surveillance cycle. So basically, we detect, we identify, notify, report, and we try to do causality assessment. So this is the this is identified by passive surveillance. Okay, so when the passive surveillance systems are picked up, are set up, this is how we kind of identify them, and then we get them reported. Now, if you just look at it, when you want to find out the cause, we actually do something called the causality assessment. So usually, the from the vaccines perspective, there are different causality assessment methodologies, you know, the French method, the Naranjo's method, but the two of them, which for vaccines, which are commonly used, one is actually the CISA method and the WHO method. Okay, if you click, so the CISA method is one which is the clinical immunization safety assessment method used primarily in the United States. The WHO method is used in several low and middle income countries all over the world. What you see, the link which is there, will actually, I'm going to give a demonstration of this tomorrow during the training program. This is what it opens out. There is also an e-learning course which will help you to access the uh, uh, the e-learning course where you can learn it yourself in a three hours time approximately. And uh, this is uh, very, very useful for us. So this is what it is. This, when you classify cases after causality assessment, what we do is we classify cases into, uh, the, sorry, there is, a, there is a spectrum by which we classify cases. On one end of the spectrum, we say that that is consistent immunization. That means the vaccine and vaccination was responsible for the adverse event. So that is what you see in the red. And on the ex uh, other end, you have something called inconsistent causal association immunization. What do you mean by that? It means vaccine and vaccination was not responsible for the adverse event. And in between, we have a category called the indeterminate. Okay. So, I mean, we'll be going into this in detail tomorrow when we are having the discussion. There is also another category which is actually called unclassifiable, where even with enough information, we still don't know where to make the, uh, how to kind of categorize this. But most importantly, remember, before you do causality assessment classification, your, uh, you must have adequate information. If you have useless information, your causality assessment will also be useless. So thank you very much. I'll stop there because of lack of time. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Awika from the U.S. I have a question that might be a little bit related to the U.S., but, you know, wondering what your thoughts are. Sometimes it's not completely clear whether the reactogenicity solicited events, um, such as injection site solicited events or also systemic solicited events, whether they are classified as adverse events or not, because they are expected and solicited. So I've seen, you know, kind of various approaches to that. So wondering what your thoughts are. Okay. Since you asked me this question and since I have the slides on the screen, let me just go back to the previous slide. Okay. So what we do is like, if you, this is actually a very, very important slide. From our point of view, the stage is, the first stage is the stage of detection where the person, after vaccination, the event is actually identified. It can be by the patient or somebody else. Then it, from our perspective, again, coming back to your question, just because an event is identified, it does not mean that it should be notified. Because an event can be identified and the event can actually be, see, look at the logic. I am a mom or a dad and I'm going for my, with, uh, uh, with my baby to get vaccinated, right? So the, the, the vaccinator is expected to tell me what are the anticipated adverse events and what to do for the anticipated adverse events. So just be, so supposing during the what to do for the anticipated adverse events, you're told, you know, please expect pain. The child will be like this, you know, give paracetamol, all that, continue breastfeeding, keep the kid warm. So many of the, even though the event gets detected, it may not get notified. Now, if the event, if the mother takes the trouble of bringing it to the notice of the health system, mm -hmm. then it will enter into the database. You understand what I mean? Not so. In other words, it is not an active surveillance system. It is a passive surveillance system. Have I answered your question? No. You don't seem, you don't. So, have no, I, sorry. I meant as particularly on clinical trials. Like no, in, in, we in, don't get involved. We uh, want to okay. talk about post-marketing surveillance. I see, I see. Okay. Right. Okay. Then that's okay. Right. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela from Cameroon. So I wanted to know, at what stage do does the country solicit external help to do causality assessment? Because most of the time, my country, I think the AFI expert committee usually does it. But I know you are you work on an international basis. And when does the country really solicit your help? Thank you. Thanks. When it becomes a public health emergency of national concern usually what happens is sometimes especially the media and uh, uh, other people are likely to rake up issues number one most of the time we get called and in fact uh, some uh, uh, number uh, the second thing which also we get called is when committees capacity needs to be built because the country does not itself have its own capacity so at that time we come there conduct a training for two three days we also look into the countries usually keep the cases among them uh, with them and then these cases are reviewed by us so and uh, we also give uh, recommendations about how to manage and things like that around that period of time in blue please Good morning. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, my question is on ca uh, casualty assessment again. So, uh, you know, uh, the assessment is actually done by government officials right from the city, district, state and the central level. Don't you think there is a need of independent panel uh, to make it more transparent and unbiased as well? Yeah, thanks. That's a very nice question. Now, we should understand when you look at the profile of the people who do causality assessment, one of the important things for us to remember is those people should not have any conflict of interest. In other words, neither the EPI program or the regulators can be a part of that committee. Is it clear? So what has to happen is the people who are there should be people like professors in a medical college and preferably independent who are not government employees because we want them to be a bit fair with what they do. Similarly, for instance, in India, you have the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, which is a pretty independent body. You have the Indian Medical Association. So similarly, you, in different countries, you have the different associations who also put in members for doing this to make sure that it is free, uh, freely done. That said, we would always recommend that a sample of cases B, which where the assessment was done, actually be reviewed by another set of people to see whether there is something called an inter uh, rater agreement. You understand what I mean? So this inter rater agreement also needs to be kind of checked. We have done some studies on that before. Okay. Yes. In white, please. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, related to the immunization stress-related uh, reactions, are there 
any guidelines being developed to help mitigate or reduce that kind of reaction, given that it's becoming more and more of a concern? And, and are there differences for different age groups, et cetera? How is that being handled? Yeah, so this particular manual, which I was just, which I showed you, the blue book, it has got two parts in it. One is the book itself, and then there is also a ready reckoner. It most, it all uh, your uh, questions would get clarified there, including techniques of how to, it is not just uh, patient related. It is also related to how you set up your immunization center. It is also related to the fact, for example, let me give you an example. The sequence with which you vaccinate. Number one, a pre-identification. How to identify that person, a vulnerable person before the vaccination. If you feel that this person is going to be a little bit stressed, you don't vaccinate it along with the major group. That's number one. Make sure that there is enough amount of privacy space. Make sure that there is somebody watching. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, there is a pre before vaccination. There is a room where people are kept uh, separately and, you know, they after during vaccination privacy and after vaccination, there is an observation for at least 30 minutes to make sure that uh, they are OK. So this is the recommendations. But then let me tell you, ground realities are completely different, especially in LMICs. Right. That's what we have to keep in mind. Please. Thank you. Um, just following on from that point about limited capacity. So in Samoa, when they had the measles MMR vaccine incident, and that was a medical error, um, the program was seized for a while after that. The measles vaccination was stopped and MMR was pulled back. How can countries with limited infrastructure manage that delay in when a causality assessment happens? And by the time you provide evidence, build the confidence back, what could be done differently or how can you kind of use that time effectively so it doesn't, I guess, pull back, withdraw the program completely and break confidence in immunization yeah. program? So uh, thanks. That's a very, very uh, uh, important and uh, also quite a difficult question because the circumstances varies from situation to situation based on the country capacity itself. One of the important things from the from WHO's perspective and not only from and all the other perspective is to make sure that we actually do not stop the immunization programs. You may temporarily suspend the immunization programs, preferably, especially if it is going to be an immunization error related adverse event. It is only related to that center. You understand? It is not actually, it is not a product related event. You understand? So it's, and similarly, immunization anxiety related events are also very closed and clustered. So what we need to do is we need to build country capacity for uh, doing quick investigations and submitting the data to for causality assessment. Now, what do you mean by quick investigations? We, we, we have got online training all. In fact, that link which I just showed you has got uh, how to do investigations quickly and how to respond to it and things like that. But, you know, the ground realities, as I said, are different. We can always come back and help you with that. That's number one. Number two, now in regional committees are also being established. Like, for instance, in the Western Pacific region, we are having this uh, multiple island countries coming together to create common AEFI committees. You understand? So these common AEF, because we understand that smaller countries like Samoa and Fiji and all these places, they really don't have the capacity to do it. So we, we club the countries together and then we, we do this. And also with virtual meetings, now things are improving. Please, in red. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I had two questions. I don't know what I can ask to. One, um, when individuals who have unusual AFI have received multiple vaccinations uh, in one day or maybe at the same time, how do you go about the causality assessment? That's one. Then secondly, um, if um, in the setting of clinical trials, laboratory abnormalities as part of AFI are closely monitored, in terms of post-market surveillance and implementation, how often do you come ac across laboratory abnormalities as AFIs? Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me answer the first question first because it's very quick. The answer is please come tomorrow for the session. Okay. <laughs> the, no, I'm actually discussing this threadbare. Let me tell you, threadbare. And I'm happy to face hundreds of bullets on this. No problem. Because, in fact, this is one very important question which you raised. And we are facing this every time. That's number one. Coming back to the lab uh, things, we have faced issues, for instance, with uh, issues like human chorionic gonadotrophin uh, getting uh, contaminated with uh, tetanus toxide vaccines and things like that. Now, remember, there was a day before yesterday, uh, there was a very nice session which, which took place, which, which came in from one of the uh, manufacturers. He was just talking about being very careful about doing the lab tests correctly. 
because if you cannot do the same uh, except for human specimens for human beings you can do the test anywhere but if you are testing the vaccine the vaccine will have to be tested only in certain labs in the world it cannot be tested in any tom dick and harry lab let me tell you that you understand what i mean so please get uh, you are welcome to talk to us in who we will tell you which lab to send it for testing and then you can send it to that particular lab you understand please uh, good morning sorry who go ahead i just had a quick question about what happens next so let's say an if you an afi committee at, at the country level has identified that this is a vaccine product related reaction what happens next is there some sort of a lawsuit is there a fund is there some support to you know to those who are affected yeah thanks a lot for that particular question so there are it again depends on the country situation the how it is handled in different different countries even for covid for instance there was a vaccine uh, you know the a, a vaccine safety compensation mechanism which was actually available so that was again done at a global level if you look at certain countries in the world you will be surprised even low and middle income countries uh, and some of them are here as well for instance nepal has got a vaccine safety compensation mechanism but it doesn't mean that it is there in all countries so if it is again one more thing we should also remember is it depends on the classification and what is the policy taken by the government for instance they may decide to pro- only compensate for product related events may not compensate for coincidental events and things like that some people offer blanket compensation so it varies from country to country depending on the country policies i will allow narendra uh, being part of the faculty with the last question is that uh, afi is uh, uh afi is uh, afi and afi as assessment is as complicated as the task of nitax and i think at country level the importance and the uh, visibility given to nitax and afi committees if it is given equal then this uh, building in uh, local capacity becomes much easier and f- uh, investigation also because in india that's what we did that in india nitag and afi committees are given almost same importance and i think in this course also you have two and a half days for afi which just indicates the importance and the complications associated with afi that's a comment thank you thank you so much narendra uh, 